This is uh, 220 that I'm talking about. Yuji was said by Ieri to now be like a cursed object steeped in Sukuna's cursed energy. And then after that, uh, Yuji says something interesting where he's like, besides, I'd eat anything to kill that creep, referencing Sukuna, of course. And then, you know, yeah. going a little further, which is just two pages, Yuji's talking to Choso, and Choso gives him that book on the soul research that Suku uh, Sukuma left him. And he says, it may prove useful. And Yuji's like, thanks. And Choso says, no problem. He's like, no, I mean about your brothers. And Choso yeah. says, that's okay too. They'll live on inside you. So have we all come to the same conclusion uh, of what's going on here or what's being implied here? I think yeah. so, yeah. yeah and yeah. UG8, UG8, the remaining brothers, right? Is that Most the, likely, that yeah. Like, I personally think... The cheesy one there, but the other ones are all probably inside of them is what I'm suspecting. I personally think we need a little bit more confirmation because I, I don't know. Now, not to not to give Viz any props, especially what happened this week, uh, this week but <laughs> the translation, depending on where you read it, was a little off depending on where you read it. It is very vague, in my opinion. So I'm, I'm very willing to believe that he did eat them, but I'm also very willing to believe that who knows because how did Choso not only get Yuki's book <laughs> but he was also to get all those death paintings out before the black hole destroyed the entire tomb and survived I don't know yeah but, uh, he had yeah, when they were going to the warehouse the back room yeah 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 Bef when uh before everything had started they they went to that warehouse and where Maki was going also and Choso was like you know you guys go ahead and we just saw him walk up to like that uh garage looking place garage thing yeah, yeah we didn't we didn't see what he did but it was implied that he got the rest of the death paintings now now where was he I storing them when he was good. getting destroyed by kenjaku that's another story where was he storing the back of the prison row it, you know it, it's it's fun. yeah no <laughs> he's got a bag of something you know some harry potter bag that's got like a <laughs> tent and something else uh, who knows you know <laughs> a pocket dimension yeah, yeah so also before we go further we actually may have been teased that this was happening, not just in this chapter, but also uh, Gege talks about this in a fan book question, which is interesting because it's like, was he genuinely asked this or was this like a planted question? So it's the sixth question under Yuji's profile in the fan book. Gege is being asked like, what happens if Yuji, who is resistant to curses, eats a death painting wound? And Gege's answer was either the death painting wound will become something like Sukuna's current state or the death painting wound itself will disappear appear and become cursed energy within Yuji. And if Yuji ingests it uh -huh. after he is already a host for Sukuna, the death painting wound will just be obliterated by him. So obviously he's not a part of Sukuna anymore. So it seems like the former mm. is happening here. Wow, Gege, spoilers, dude. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Like, what are you doing? This was probably like three years ago as well. Eh? Like, <laughs> That's ago. so crazy. But yeah, no, Zonin, you're completely right. I feel like honestly, that would be the selling point to me where it says that this is something that Gege has been building for uh building towards for a while if that is the case especially because it's so clearly laid out in the chapter i love when gege does this because it makes stuff like this like undeniable where he specifically laid it out to where uh, shoko says that yuji is essentially a cursed object bathed in sakuna's cursed energy and gege just laid out in that interview that if that was the case he'd be the death paintings would literally just disseminate and just become cursed energy boost for him so it's right there oh also it's um, like what strong enough Seven. to become like Sukuna inside of them, you know? So you could have a bunch of them chilling. That's where my theory comes from, where you have just them all chilling out as the boys inside of Yuji <laughs> and stuff. But, you know, like, who knows? Who knows what could happen there? Is that where <laughs> that pseudo flashback came from, where he's, like, at the yeah, yeah, table? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, and you got, like, the Junipei stuff from season one. I know, like, they're all passed on people, but whenever they pass on, they go to this picnic realm area or something, you know? Like, <laughs> the picnic so, realm. <laughs> yeah, so who knows what's going on, but I like to think that maybe there's some weird realm where you can communicate with them and all, you know, like, it's anime, who knows what can happen, but... Yeah. Um, I kind of have, like, a, a question for you guys, like, it, it does say, okay, so eating these, like, death painting wounds, it would, like, increase Yuji's cursed energy reserves, so do you guys think he'll gain a cursed technique, or is, is his whole shtick just, like, full physical brawler, and now he has, like, the amped up cursed energy? 
Like, is that enough to handle the big guys like Kenjaku and Sukuna? Because honestly, I don't really know myself. Yeah. There was the, uh, the hint where he would later imprint Sukuna's powers onto his body. And I'm still hoping that's the case. I think that would be pretty cool. But um, mm. yeah, like, what do you guys think? I guess, like, with the... When he was stepping or walking towards Sukuna and then afterwards with Sukuna looking at his finger, people were kind of confused. Was that Yuji using cleave on Sukuna? Or was that Megami, you know, like, playing with his hand there so like I, it could possibly right. be yuji you know like gaining some control or i don't know you know who knows i like the idea that yuji did gain sukuna's abilities initially but now i want him to you know have his own technique and i think him eating the curse wounds is going to like allow him to get some form of technique instead of just having like divergent fist and blade mm -hmm. flash but yeah no that's um yeah I like to think that at least. Hey, so. hey, Ronan, what are your thoughts on that? Sukuna looking at his finger and seeing that like cut or mark on it. What do you think was going on there? When he's using a like cleave on Yuji, you mean? Um, it's like just after I. Yeah, I think when he's so, uh, stepping out of the bath, I think he means. Mm, oh, oh, Megami there. Yeah, so I definitely think that at that point, that is that is Megami's resistance. And that's kind of the reason I think Sukuna goes on to fight Yorozu, specifically because he the the idea is, you know, sure, dipping himself or like, you know, drenching himself in evil is a pretty good measure. But I would imagine for someone that's like whole technique is the shadows and darkness, that may not be a, enough of a, a closer. So the idea of Sukuna would be to completely make Megami despair and then further go after Yorozu. And I definitely think that's what Sukuna's intentions are at that point. And I think Megami is kind of, um, it's not so much that Megami has a whole level of resistance, but more so that Sukuna is aware that he is fighting um, within him because he does seem to be very able to tell what will and won't completely kind of like drown out Megami in his control. He seems to be very intimately yeah. aware of that fact. He even He's even aware of that fact back in Shibuya when he knows that Yuji is about to take back over. So Sukuna seems to be like pretty able to tell when a soul is able to resist his his possession ability i yeah, definitely that, feel fair. like he's done it before you know like, i definitely feel like he's swapped a couple bodies before and has possibly had this issue in the past where he's had to you know like subdue someone's soul that's tried to fight back and he just kind of knows how to deal with it at this point but yeah or he hypothesizes on how he deals with it at this point if he hasn't done it you know from past people perhaps but I, I like the idea also that the whole idea behind barriers in general is like a construction made up by Tengen or Master Tengen. And before the day of a thousand years ago, you didn't have barriers. You, you've got uh, Sakona with his, you know, like malevolent shrine obviously, which doesn't have a barrier on it at all. And then you've got people with their perfect domains from ages ago. But I just like the idea that possibly Tengen has made everyone think that you need to put your domain within a barrier to construct it, to construct it, whereas like to to like kind of um, subdue their strength and not like, allow them to possibly you know like destroy what he's created if that makes sense because he's like created the idealistic world around him for like jujutsu and everything and he doesn't want that to you know fall back to what it was a thousand years ago and perhaps if he sees someone like with a barrierless domain he's like he'll probably just start freaking out i don't know that's my uh, initial thought on that but i have no idea if that's truth or not there's still so much going on with tengen that we don't even know and now that he's mixed up with uh kinjaku it's slowly getting revealed to us but that is true and speaking there, of yeah. the uh, barrierless domains it goes back to weeb's question has yuji uh, received possibly sakuna's curse technique malevolent shrine mm -hmm. which is implied to be that's like his innate technique. Maybe it's not, maybe it is, but I think that he has yeah. it because I think Malevolent Shrine is like a Kotsu's curse technique. Like whatever it directly is, you know, when we see Rika and she has like that, you know, she opens up her thing and there's all kind of weapons in there. It's kind of mm -hmm. like that. Like that's his shrine. It just holds curse techniques and this could go back to i'm sorry i forget who said it but yuji's gonna have like a bunch of different curse technique by the end of the series maybe his friends as well i think that's what this is possibly leading to now what do you guys think about that yeah i definitely think that yuji with um 
like multiple techniques would be or, or using Sukuna's technique against him would be uh, a very cathartic thing for his character i i think just due to the fact of Sukuna, while using you know dismantle and cleave has done so many things to just alter yuji's life or physically hurt him himself i mean yuji has an even lower self-esteem than he of, like when regards to himself than he did before because Sukuna used that very technique to just decimate an entire portion of shibuya and all the citizens that were that were residing in that in that place so yuji being able to use that technique to some extent in some sort of like divine retribution on Sukuna, i think that would be really nice um that being said i remember uh fake we mentioning earlier like is it possible that yuji can even get up to this sort of top tier level with just cursed energy reinforcement um in hands and i i thought that was interesting and i was thinking about it while you guys were talking and i think one of the interesting things to consider is this right it's it's like yuta in base just just normally no cursed energy enhancements considers himself to be like a pretty weak and frail guy and i mean just by looking at him you would probably also think the same thing but just through having a lot of cursed energy he's able to match if not like surpass characters like yuji who are known for being superhuman on top of having you know a decent amount of cursed energy so if you think that the consumption of the death painting wombs has like seriously amped the level of cursed energy that yuji has to like an extreme extremely high degree doubling or tripling what he had before there's a pretty good argument for yuji just physically to become someone that is that is shooting right past the his previous levels and maybe getting to those toji levels and beyond in terms of physical ability and we know that obviously toji with physical strength alone was able to get some some good work done on on high level characters in the past i feel like gojo coming back is one of the greatest things that could possibly happen to someone like yuji especially in the place that he's in right now where he seemed to have, whether it's not really confirmed or not, to have gained a lot of power from, let's call it a Zenkai boost from when Megami first got um, uh, possessed, right? It, even Sakuna mentioned it, like, where did all of this power come from? Whether that is, one, Sakuna just actually meeting up with Yuji for the first time physically since back in, like, what, episode six, or, you know, early chapters when they first fought in the mine realm, or generally Yuji did receive a, a decent power up just from that bloodlust, it's unsure of. Now that Gojo is back, we saw even in the beginning of the series how beneficial it was for Yuji to have someone like Gojo there to help him, one, hone his skills and show him that some of these bad habits, quote unquote, that he was developing like Divergent Fist can be used in good ways to help him. I.e. like when he ends up fighting Choso in Shibuya and he ends up learning how to use Divergent Fist at will, it ends up saving him when he fights Mahito in the long run. So Gojo was right in the long run, even though everyone like Toto would have told him that Divergent Fist was bad to use. So I feel like now that Yuji's gone without Gojo for so long, Gojo can kind of come back and be like, all right, these are your flaws and I'm taking all of the gloves off and I'm going to show you what it means to be a real sorcerer. And if that means I'm going to have to awaken your curse techniques, I'm, I feel like Gojo being back is going to be so critical to Yuji getting to this level that we're speaking about in order to actually hold some weight in this just all out war that we're going to get on, on Christmas yeah. Eve. Because because he's got to hold his own in some manner against like Sugaru Gido or, or against you know like Kenjaku. So yeah, he's he's gotta gotta get way stronger. And even though he's gonna have everyone else with him, it's still like Urume, for example, was able to stop you know Maki and Yuji from just being able to catch up to Sakuna. So it's like they need to get strong, stronger. It's just uh, yeah, they need this month right now, and they need Gojo to kind of like lead them out. They don't have Masamichi. They don't really have Gakugan. They don't have any of the teachers anymore. You know, like it's all everyone's gone. He's the only one that can kind of, I guess, guide them down the correct path, which hopefully he will. Yeah. Um, one more thing, too, is that we know Sukuna has some sort of, like, dominion or special correlation with soul. So the the fact that, like, Chozo gave Yuji Yuki's research on the soul in that book, likely having in-depth and detailed information on humans, cursed energy and stuff, I do think that book will be the key to Yuji maybe learning something about the soul and defeating Sukuna, because I'm pretty sure in that panel, Chozo does say that it might be useful in some way so it's definitely gonna mm. gonna come back okay that, that book is interesting like so we're gonna be talking about yuji's curse technique what it may or may not be a lot of discussion on this and it seems like judging off of you know what we saw when he was training it could be soul swapping or 
something. I mean, at least just right now, it seems like if he does have some kind of curse technique or ability, that's what it is. He can swap souls with someone or swap bodies to some extent. And it's possible that maybe this always was his ability. And that is why Kenjaku used him as a vessel for Sukuna because he has that ability. Therefore, Sukuna can't just have full reign over him because we've seen that when other sorcerers reincarnate, they don't have the same kind of relationship that Yuji and Sukuna have. So what do you think about that? Yeah, um, honestly, I think it's a, a cool abil ability because it also kind of parallels Sukuna and Kenjaku in, you know, how they switch bodies or switch vessels. Not the exact same, though, because, you know, unlike both Sukuna and Kenjaku, Yuji doesn't take over Kusakabe like how Sukuna takes over Megami and how Kenjaku takes over Geto. No, it's more like Yuji just switches with Kusakabe, so... It's going to be really interesting to see how that plays out for the final battle. I think Yuji did say in chapter 221 that he has a plan to save Fushiguro. So assuming that he had already learned of that switching ability from the moment, then it could definitely correlate to, hey, maybe somehow it helps Megami regain his own soul. Maybe Yuji switches with Megami or something. I honestly don't know because there's not much uh, details of how the switching actually works, but it would make sense narratively right in the beginning it was megami who saved yuji and allowed him to live because he was a good person in his own judgment so now this time it's yuji's turn to save megami and it's even more ironic that they're both needing to be saved from the same person sakuna being the problem so yeah that's the thing right the way in which he swaps so we know that the way kenjaku swaps he's just going to use the curse energy that the person on the body has which is why he got a special grade body with ghetto the way Sukuna swaps, he makes you stronger. Like, he puts his soul within you, and now you're Sukuna level. Depending on, you know, if he was 15 finger level and he goes into your body, now your body is 15 finger level in strength. But the way Yuji swaps, we don't know if it's a consciousness swap or, like, a complete soul swap. So, like, similar to Sukuna, power goes with him or not. And it's sort of like if you've ever seen Dragon Ball when Captain Ginyu swapped with Goku. Captain Ginyu swapped with Goku, and he was just stuck in a goku body that was super strong and goku was in captain ginyu's body who was super weak so they were screwed but if yuji swaps and like the power goes with them then it sort of defeats the purpose in swapping but because the idea is that you want yuji to go swap with sukuna so that sukuna is in a weak yuji body or at least that's what i think the build up is you give yuji the swap technique then you go swap sukuna to yuji's body again but this time sukuna doesn't have all of the power that would happen if it's a consciousness swap but if it's like a complete soul swap, then it's a good chance that once they swap, all the Sukuna power just goes back to Yuji's body. It's all about whether it's just a consciousness swap or a soul swap, which we don't know yet. Yeah, uh, I mean, like, it, it would be crazy, right, if Yuji can actually learn the strengths, techniques, and abilities within the body he's in. Um, like, as in, like, when he switches back to his own body, the techniques that he's learned gets implanted with the new g so okay like he was in kusakabe and what kusakabe has like the new shadow style so maybe that's why kusakabe was saying like get the grasp of it yuji or something along those lines um and i think that could like you know if this was the case uh this could sort of give yuji the necessary power up needed to fight sukuna having like a vast amount of techniques and abilities up his arsenal i don't think it would necessarily take away his you know significant physical combat prowess either he can still go hand in hand if he wants to but just has more options um but yeah no that's that's my thoughts on yuji power up um the interesting thing about yuji is that kenjaku never lied when he said that yuji is a vessel he is the most powerful vessel alive he can eat anything it took a spirit as strong as sukuna's to not get obliterated instantly because gege stated that once he eats anything that's like a normal curse object if it's not as strong as something like sukuna he just gains power from it he obliterates the essence inside and absorbs cursed energy. So pretty much what you have now is this guy that is free of Sukuna, can eat anything, and can gain pretty much exponential power, whether or not the actual technique from Kusakabe is unique to Kusakabe or something new from Yuji. I expect something with the soul either way, because as we go more into JJK, the soul keeps coming up more and more, and now we have like a book on it and all this other stuff. Yeah, that's what makes me think, at least, that this has something to do with the soul, because... 
it's brought up in chapter 220 uh, after we see Choso give Yuji uh, Sakumo's notes or research. He says records of soul research that Sakumo left along with the back of the prison realm. Gives it purposely to Yuji, says that it may prove useful. So I assume it has something to do with the soul because like you said, you know, the soul keeps coming up more and more. Uh, also, another interesting thing that's said in the previous page to this in 220 is that uh, Yuji says that Iyari said, I'm now like a cursed object steeped in Sakuna's cursed energy. So does that give more credence to the fact that he is like just be able to swap with anybody essentially? Um, and, and also, you know, it goes back to the, the beginning of the series uh, where Gojo said that in time, your body will learn Sakuna's curse technique. So I like that. Uh, what we were talking about earlier how, you know, if you go into his body, then he learns your curse technique and then he comes back to it and now he has it. And now, I don't know, he has like multiple curse techniques or something, which is still fringe because of what uh, Kenjaku said about the brain being able to only handle so much. But Yuji is a beast, as we just said. So maybe he's uh, above that rule possibly, but... I guess actually zone in to add on what you were saying, it just reminded me. So yeah, like when Gojo said that Yuji was gonna inherit Sukuna's techniques one day, I'm just thinking like, wait, but how would Gojo know that? Or how would Gojo know that? How do how would we know? And I'm thinking maybe it's like his six eyes, because we know um in the past arc his six eyes was able to figure out how that paper bagman's curse technique exactly worked, just like upon looking at him. So it does like further help the theory that yeah the body he does uh the body he does switch to and then comes back to his own body he does keep those techniques once learned yeah and to add on to a fake weeb was saying it actually is just stated in a q a that the six eyes can see through curse techniques and like learn the interest and to add on to a fake weeb was saying it is stated in a q a that the six eyes can just see through curse techniques and just learn all of the intricacies so it just leaves more credence to a fake weeb was saying yeah that's um that is interesting because it is very likely that he was able to see that Yuji could do that. But then also, doesn't he tell Yuji that like he doesn't have a curse technique? Yeah, he does. So it's well, like, yeah. It, yeah, no, it's weird. Maybe like he was uh, directly referring to like Yuji doesn't, ah, uh, I don't know. Like he doesn't ha really have an innate technique, but uh, yeah, I honestly don't know. It, it's really confusing. <laughs> yeah, I well, know. It's like either it's like suppressed or something and he can't see it with the six eyes somehow. I don't, what were you going to say, uh, Shinobi? Whether or not he can actually see the full curse technique, it did seem like when Megami knew that the cursed object could incarnate, so I doubt that Sukuna is the only sorcerer in history to have incarnated before, and they generally know that, okay, once somebody incarnates, maybe somebody got a cursed technique in the past. That is possible. Um, you know, Yuji is down for the count at this point because in the last chapter, like, after Sukuna separated from him, and put himself into like his pinky and you know went to megumi he leveled yuji like i guess this is like the most serious strike he's ever taken in the series like in this panel it looks like he's like going through his torso <laughs> like this is like death and he's sent through a building and lands on top of a skyscraper so he's gonna need some serious divine intervention here to come back from this so i think we might all have a similar idea as to what could be going on with him here. And uh, it goes back to chapter 12 <laughs> because um, Gojo says that in due time, your body will learn Sukuna's curse technique. And it's like really interesting the way that he says it here, like looking back on the latest chapter, like your body. And now that Sukuna like isn't in Yuji anymore, is this the time when he like develops his abilities and I guess as a result, he also could pick up reverse curse technique too, since we, you know, Sukuna does that. But that's a whole other thing. But just at least his curse technique could possibly come into play here. What do you guys think about that? So I've actually, I've actually thought about that, and and that's been one of the more more popular ideas circulating around. And I think it's an interesting one. Um, I think there have been a lot of times where like we as a fan base have just been like, Yuji, please do something like bring out an ability bring out something new because like you are getting cooked by everybody around you right i mean it's been, kind of been that way um since the end of shibuya yuji's been 
uh, sort of outclassed physically and cursed energy wise and all that stuff. And I do think that if he did develop these techniques, that would be it would be good for his like battle power. The only reason I kind of I think it may not be time for Yuji yet is simply because one he would have to learn reverse curse technique first, which is possible. I mean, we've seen Gojo um learn reverse curse technique on the on the cusp of death in his fight versus Doji. So it's hundred percent possible. Um but the reason I, I think it's also possible that he doesn't develop it here and we get assistance maybe from um outside colonies now that Yorozu, the uh, sorcerer that incarnated in Sumuki or Sumiki rather, uh, open up the barriers, we may get outside players helping or attacking Sukuna. But the reason I think Yuji may not come into play with the technique here is simply because I don't think it changes much of how the fight goes. Like, I think the moment Yuji will come in here and really, like, have his technique or have a technique or something to play around with is personally because I think that will be, like, a fight changer, right? Like, before the before the technique, he's losing and he can't, he, there's no matter what he do or what he does, he can't win. But after the technique, he'd be able to, not, not so much as dominate his opponent, but it would be, like, pre-awakening Gojo versus Toji versus post-awakening Gojo versus Toji. But when I look at him now, when I look at the prospect of him awakening and blossoming as a sorcerer, I still, like, I, I try to piece any technique together, maybe the anti-gravity technique, and I'm like, that's not enough to beat Sukuna. Maybe it's Sukuna slashing techniques, right? And maybe as Dismantle and Cleave, and even at this point, I'm like, would that be enough to beat Sukuna? Because it seems that he's stronger. It seems that Sukuna's stronger and faster. He now has more variety and versatility. He's more intelligent. I feel like we need characters that have the experience to deal with what Sukun has got at this point in time. I'm open to other ideas, obviously, and we're we're going to see in these next few chapters whether or not Yuji's going to be making a move. Um, but I, I, I really wonder if Yuji's going to be able to bounce back quickly enough to develop a technique and then be a useful component in a fight against Sukuna. Yeah, I mean... I, I love uh, kind of what you said, Ronin, uh, where kind of we all know at this point that Yuji needs some kind of power up. He needs some kind of awakening. And if, uh, you know, if there wasn't a, a better time for it, then now is. Um, I mean, one thing that I've also kind of considered, because in my opinion, and you guys can check me if you think I'm wrong or if you have any kind of different viewpoints, but I feel like even though we were told that Yuji will eventually adapt and grow into Sukuna's curse technique, whether it be, like Ronan said, the chef technique, or it even be something like his mom's curse technique, like the anti-gravity, um, I feel like one thing I kind of view is, even if Yuji was to develop the slashing technique, I personally don't think he would use it just based off the trauma he has surrounding the entire event that Sakuna, you know, basically destroyed an entire city with it. We know Yuji's very uh, specific with his emotions and very limiting to himself in, in those aspects. I mean, heck, that was part of the whole reason why Sakuna was even able to pull off this trick here because Yuji doesn't view himself or, you know, ha has very self-deprecating views. So one, I think even if he was to develop a curse technique, like Ronan said, I, I don't really see that being his his exit in this scenario. But one thing I've also heard is we already know, based off the ending of the chapter, that you know it's possible Hana or Angel may be exiting uh, <laughs> exiting the fight soon, based off of what we've seen. So I've also heard theories and rumors that uh, Yuji may become a vessel again, but this time he'll become a, ve a vessel of Angel. Um, I don't know what you guys think of that or if you guys have any other uh, opinions on Yuji, but... Mm, I I think, like, Yuji right now, um, like kind of Zonin said earlier, you can see, like, the punch kind of going through his, his stomach and blood is literally splatting from his back, so that implies that, yeah, the punch went through, he has an anime donut hole. <laughs> so, yeah, like, out, outside colonies... Someone could come up, really Yuta, I think is like the only option and, and some others, but I don't think Kashimo or anyone el else would kill Yuji. Um, either him or if it's not Yuta, then it's got to be himself unlocking reverse curse technique, going through some sort of awakening or enlightening moment. And be like another aspect to, I guess, characters going through awakening like Gojo, Maki, etc. is that their mentality sort of changes as well. Um, with Gojo in the Toji fight, when we first saw him like feel the core of cursed energy and unlock reverse cursed technique, 
he was he was in like this transcendent state saying like uh i can't remember but it was like oh sorry amane i'm not angry for you nor do i feel vengeful toward anyone um and from that quote plus like the visual representation of him floating in the sky and actually feeling free it showed that gojo had truly released all his past sufferings and thus being able to tap into the core of cursed energy and we've seen like that similar a mindset change happen with megami you know needing to be more selfish and then maki with her sumo wrestle and i think chozo as well so given that yuji's on the brink of death or is dead but with the pretense of eventually coming back then yeah there's no better time to have an enlightening moment after this whole Sakuna stuff dies down, if it dies down. But I, I don't see Yuji waking up the next chapter and, you know, him finding Sakuna. What the true big three of this series is. So when I say big three, it's kind of become like a trope in the bottle, battle manga as of late. I don't know if it necessarily started with Naruto, but since then a lot of series have been kind of going with that flow. You know, you have like the three main characters. You have like Naruto, Sasuke, and Sakura. And in JJK, we thought, for the most part, it was going to be Yuji, Nobara, and Megumi. But now, <laughs> it doesn't really seem that way because, you know, we talked about it in our, you know, our first collab that Megumi, a lot of death flags. It, it, like, we're not surprised if he dies at this point. And Nobara, she might be dead already. I, still, no one knows. Now, I don't even know if Gege knows, but... Nobara not in the picture anymore. And it makes me think like another thing that we were talking about, um, how Gege subverts tropes. Uh, we were talking about how, you know, if you would have said, you know, Yuji's not going to kill Mahito in chapter 132, that's like not going to happen. It's actually going to be Kenjaku that comes over. So is something similar happening in this series where we only see what the true big three is in the final arc of it, which is probably going to be Yuji, uh, Okotsu, and Maki. What do you think about that? Probably, yeah. Yeah, I think so. But I, something I've always wondered, the entire series, are there any other families, like big families, that kind of just got pushed to the side? We got the big three families, you know, like talking about big three. Did... Any of these big three families in the in the past get taken over by per se another family? It's just an idea as well. But yeah, I'll, I'll go back to the to the main question. I think yeah, the the big three from the series from now on is going to be Yuji, Yuta, and Maki. That's what I think are our uh, our big three personally. Because also we had a Kotsu straight up saying that he is going to kill Kenjaku. So I'm thinking like yeah, yeah. you know we have obviously Yuji versus Sakuna, and now we have Kenjaku versus a Kotsu, and then I guess. Maki mm. versus Urame. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Maki kind of there just flying around helping everyone out, you know, doing her thing. <laughs> She's just moving at Mark 3 speeds across the battle, just <laughs> helping everyone out. So this is a little crazy, a little off the wall, a little head y but it's something that I was kind of speaking with uh, uh, with my chat the other day, and uh, Dia Diavolo kind of sparked it in my brain, and I kind of want to see what you guys think about it. Um, so going with the big three, I definitely agree that um, uh, Jujutsu Kaisen, as Gege really wanted it to be, was a complete, you know, destruction of the big three characters. You know, that trope where there's two guys, a girl, and they have a sensei, and that's the main the main group of characters that we kind of finish with. Clearly, as we all mentioned, that's not going to be the case. Um, but in, in the history of Jujutsu Kaisen, we have a lot of big threes. We have the three families that survived in the Jutsu society. And also we know we have the three vengeful spirits that kind of started everything back in the day. Now, Kenjaku, Sakuna, Arame, while they're all threatening, Arame maybe not so much as others after what happened with Gojo. Um, those are three great villains that are gonna be going up against what, 12, 15 people? So I feel like a great way to kind of figure out who is going to be the top three characters in our out of our protagonist group, the three characters that make the biggest impact out of everybody would be putting up putting them up against characters that would really challenge them. So I don't want to have another Cullen game. I don't want to have him Kunjaku just reincarnate more players. But what would you guys say if in order to beef up the villain, um, the villain numbers a little bit, the three final villains that Kenjaku reincarnates to help them out, and this would be the three vengeful spirits themselves. Ooh. Yeah, I, 
like possibly has he even got them under his control i don't know if he could do that with ghetto's technique but like you know like maybe he drops them along with like all of his curse spirits to just be a nuisance well yeah. i feel i i feel like that would be a great way to like make the big three like maki okotsu and yuji would get a big mm. fun because we know like kenjaku would be a great fight against yuta do we really think yuta's gonna beat kenjaku though maybe not i don't know what you guys think about that but uh, i feel like if we really want a lot of uh, these final group of characters to have a big moment having only three villains to have them with makes it kind of rough to do that yeah yeah no you're you're right we do have like a huge lineup of good guys and um like only <clears throat> or three guys on the villain side so oh. Uruume, so it's going to be really interesting interesting to see how like these final battles will play out from here because while I do think like Gojo and Sukuna, they're for sure they're gonna get a one v one. It just has to happen. Um, I don't also think that like that necessarily means Sukuna will only fight Gojo. Like either before or after they have their grand fight. You know, assuming Sukuna defeats Gojo or whatnot. I think we can still see like a combination of matchups like Yuta and Maki and Hakuri against Sukuna, or just like a, a combination of characters against one person. Um, because like, kind of like we discussed earlier, I do believe Yuji has to play a major role in Sukuna's defeat if he gets defeated. So, yeah, like with a bunch of characters we got on the good side, we can definitely expect maybe like a 3v1 or more type of battle. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, one thing. JJK. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Are uh, you like 100%? Like, we all forgot. This has got to happen. Kenjaku will release Mahito back. 100%. Like, I don't even know why, like, this has skipped my mind, but 100% he's going to drop. Mahito back for Yuji to go ham on. That 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 will be a fire. Like surely, that becomes a battle in this final battle here. He brings him out as his like overpowered hyper killing form or whatever he's in, and just lets him go ham throughout the battlefield because he's still a threat, especially with his um you know like soul manipulation. Or can he bring him out after using item like transform? As much as I love Mahito, I think it was confirmed that like Uzumaki is like does destroy yeah, like yeah, all the curses yeah. when they're used. And like Idol Transfiguration, I think it was confirmed Kenjaku was only able to use it that one time too. Yeah. 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 That's why I was wondering like could he bring him back? But yeah, no, good point. Good point. Maybe I'm I would love that. I would I would I would not be you know, it's one of those things where like we can all get be like, oh I would hate if like he just brought back a character for no reason. But you know what? I feel like Mahito is a great exception to that. But uh, we'll let everybody yeah, yeah, else talk. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get off this tangent. <laughs> Seeing Mahito come back would be really cool, yeah. Um I do think though one of the one of the big things is, you know, we talk about big moments and we talk about needing those those one v ones or more villains and well I think some more antagonist would be nice to sort of see go up against um go up against our our, our heroes or whatever. I think like a, a a big part of what JJK has been about fight wise is uh, not running the ones, uh, being completely unfair in regards to that. I mean, Yuji and Toto is a pretty is a pretty like famous duo for jumping, right? They obviously jumped Hanami, they jumped Maito. I mean, Hanami went up against like multiple groups of people. First, it was like Irimaki, Megami, and Kamo. Then it was Maki and Megami. Then it was Toto and Yuji, right? I think it's very very possible that each character just gets jumped and the focus is going to be on those like those group battles if you will right maybe outside of mm -hmm. gojo versus sukuna or maybe you have some like some support in the background with some other strong characters i could see someone being eliminated from the sort of like group effort in kashimo i feel like kashimo has no interest in synergizing with everybody else i feel like it's very possible that he's going to be like a month I'm not waiting a month to fight Sukuna. We're throwing him. <laughs> Tell me where he is. I'm going to fight him right now. I'm gonna uh, like I'm getting this done. You guys do whatever you do. And then I could see Kashimo like making an exit from the story that way, personally. Um, getting rid of um like not only handling his story in a way that I think it makes sense for his character, but also sort of thinning the herd of powerful char characters we have going up against Sukuna, Kenjaku, Narame. Um, that being said, though, I definitely think Kenjaku can be jumped by a decent amount of people just because curse spirit manipulation um, like kind of allows 
for Kenjaku to be jumped without being overwhelmed physically, if he releases, mm -hmm. like, if, if he's been over time gathering a similar amount of curses that Ghetto did in Volume Zero, he could have hundreds to thousands of cursed spirits at his disposal. And we saw what, like, a swarm of low-level curses did to Choso. So it's not really impossible or even, like, um, not feasible for him to be able to handle a bunch of characters at once. Then you factor in Arame, Sukuna, and all of that stuff. Yeah. We know Kinjaku's gone around getting more curses. Like, he got a deity from a different country. Like, a deity <laughs> curse from a different country. So, uh, he's definitely got some stuff, for sure. So, uh, yeah, I can't wait to see what he actually has. It'd be interesting. Your thoughts on that, uh, Weeb, if you had any? Yeah. Um, sorry, I kind of want to go back to the... Uh... What was it the, the the big three? Oh please! Uh, like please. while you guys were talking, I was just kind of like thinking about it. Mm. Honestly, it is like really sad when I think, man, like it's not Yuji, Megami, and Nobu anymore. It's like you said, likely gonna be Yuji, Yuta, and Maki. But like you know what? Like I since like you guys already said it, it's it's that I'm gonna have like a different opinion, and I'll just say I still believe um, Yuji, Maki, and Megami will still be the big three. Like I don't know. What I'm just kind of thinking of um, that scene in naruto where because like you know how sasuke was away from most of the story and well, well he was still considered the big three and then they all kind of joined up in the war arc so i don't know i mean i know that sounds too happy for jujutsu kaisen but, but man a trio reun uh, reunion i'm hoping for that i i mean yeah, yeah, yeah we all to see nobara back yeah too, we all want but... it for sure nobara <laughs> if she does come back you know would probably have a similar effect as gojo on the internet not as big but definitely yeah, viral yeah. worthy but we were also running into the issue which i agree with is that there's not enough villains to go around and that's very true and i would love if the big three ventral spirits came back because they've been talked about enough for me to think that they eventually have to come into play and i hope they do but what if we have already seen what everyone's opponent could be or just a big thing that everyone can face in lieu of having these big foretold 1v1s, which may or may not happen. And it's that friggin' big Uzumaki curse thing that Kenjaku's ultimate plan revolves around, merging all of the citizens of Japan into the barrier, into Tengen, and then they make that thing. It's like, I think for sure that is going to be made and yes gege will go as far as slaughtering a hundred million japanese people just to get this plot across and it's like hmm. everyone essentially has to fight that thing at once if not you know that then of course we'll have the thanos versus the avengers on titan moment where you know everybody's going against sakuna he's just wrecking house but aside from that what do you think about that big uzumaki curse thing I think it's kind of crazy, um, but like I, I, because the one tough part about that, and like, and, and honestly, I while I think it would be absolutely just insane of an ending, we know that the um, conditions to actually start the merger are for the culling game to end, and for the culling game to end, um, Kenjaku basically made the rule that he would absolutely have to kill basically everyone that was ever a player in the culling game. So that means he would have to essentially kill Yuji, kill Maki. He would have to kill. I can't. I can't think of everybody. But you get what I'm saying. What do you guys think about that? That is very true. It's pretty but like... we do have the ability to leave the calling game. Hmm. Yes. True. Yeah. They but... do have the option. You just have to substitute someone. But can you substitute someone new into the game? If, okay. You know what I mean? Like, because then. Because yeah, it conflicts. That's why I've been like, it conflicts this whole time. Like, uh, at least that'd be instances. such a great plot twist. Like, like Kenjaku's like, are they like, uh, like the last, like Yuji is the last person alive, and he's like, oh, you're not gonna kill me, and he's like, all right, I don't have to, and just swaps him out for like Ichichi, <laughs> and then kills him. Ichichi, <laughs> the domain barrier. R.I.P. He can't make it to the end of the series. He gets dogged at the very end. That'd be so sad. I, I love how like Ichichi was doing his big play for like Yorizu, and then he just gets done like a man doesn't even know what happened probably he's just somewhere in the culling game right now <laughs> <Just> sitting <laughs> in a waiting around. room like did they forget about me <laughs> like, what's, what's going on like <laughs> all right so lately the story has been revolving around sakuna and one of the big questions is like you know what's his origin where does he come from 
why does he look the way that he does? I've been talking about this for like, I guess years now. I guess most of us in the community have. So brought together some other Jujutsu Kaisen creators to help talk about this. We've got Mir, No Operator, and the Fake Weeb. What's up, guys? Hello, hello. Yo, glad to be here. Hey, how are we doing, everybody? Thanks for having me. So we were talking a little bit about this before the uh, recording started, but the idea, I guess you could say, uh, for Sukuna, at least where Gege got it from, was actually like this creepypasta from 2chan, interestingly enough. Uh, where, like, long story short, these uh, students, maybe kids or something, they find uh, this, like, ancient mummified uh, corpse of this individual who's apparently Sukuna, and they have to get it to a certain temple, and he becomes, like, uh, the cursed Buddha, essentially. I know that doesn't sound that interesting, but I think this story is also like really old or something. It comes from the uh, the Nihon Shoki, which is like one of the oldest pieces of literature or something. Um, don't quote me on that, but that's basically the long and the short of it. Another super interesting thing that I really didn't pick up on uh, until I saw this recently was that uh, on like the cover of chapter one of Jujutsu Kaisen, in the background here, you see like that mummy with the kenjaku looking clothes on um this you know it's not confirmed that it's sakuna but i think this is like supposed to represent the original um folklore around sakuna um because like what is this thing you know you never see it right we never see this in the series as far as i know i mean mm, if yeah. it's for Go all ahead. I know, like it is something uh, that Gege could be foreshadowing to, or just uh, planning to reference later when we, whenever we do get that Hey and Era flashback that we're definitely uh, we we have to get right. Um, because if you look at it, one of the foreshadow, one of the other foreshadowings in this picture is one of uh, Megami's little Gamma Shikigami it has Sukuna's markings. So it also wouldn't surprise me. I mean, if he's going to foreshadow something like that 213 chapters or 212 chapters before it happens, that something like the mummified Sukuna in the background could mean something 300 to 400 chapters later. Wow. Yeah, you're blowing my mind. I just realized that now the frog does have the markings. That's wild. And also you were saying like him planning it out since the first chapter. Um, Weeb, this is something we talked about like last year. Um about how, about how Gege uh, talked about he had Megumi's like story already planned out ahead of time. And we were wondering like, what does that mean? Does it mean like Megumi's gonna die or something? But it's like, do you think he had this, like Sukuna taking him over planned this whole time? Um, Sukuna taking over Megumi's body? I, I don't think so because I do remember like when he first met Megumi, he wasn't really interested in him until he opened his 10 shadows technique so it's very weird how like all this planning and like everything came together because now okay he got the 10 shadows technique and it's almost as if he planned it from the start but from what we know it it wasn't planned so it's very interesting how i guess like kenjaku and sakuna planned everything to come together yeah i will say this i definitely think it was planned from the beginning uh, I don't know if you guys have heard, but there is a theory, it's on um, Reddit as well, where in Japanese tradition, there's this um 10 steps to a reincarnation. I forgot what the exact name is. I think it's like a Buddha 10 steps to reincarnation or something like that. And it is basically going about the same way that the 10 shadows technique is. And the way that the thing works in Japanese tradition is once the final step, like the 10th step is attained, you get a full reincarnation. And the final and tenth step, if you guys remember, is going to be Maharaga. He is, and it seems like he's going to do that in the recent chapter. Like, he's summoning Maharaga to tame it, and then we might see, like, a reincarnation. If it follows with the Japanese tradition. Oh. Hmm. Wow. Oh, yeah. I never heard of that. Oh, yeah. yeah, I have a friend that has, like, everything on it. Wow. Probably in my DMs. But... So, like, yeah, what, I can he, get that. he would, like, absorb... Or, I don't know, or this would be like Maharaga's 
secret ability or something? No, no, no. It's like, so it's like once you fulfill all the 10 steps, you gain a reincarnation, like in the lore of like this. I don't know what the exact name of it is. I can get the exact name. But once you complete the 10th step, which is Maharagi, you know, all the other ones are like the other 10 shadows, which are, I want to say like weak in comparison, but Maharagi is like the final, like grand step. And once that one has been tamed, then, then it's over. Because if you notice, Segunda's already tamed. The other one's like Divine Dog. You saw he summoned it in the recent chapter. But the only one that he hasn't tamed that's left is Maharaga. So once he tames Maharaga, you know, if it lines up with this um, thing that's in Japanese lore, then he would gain the full reincarnation. Oh, okay. So it kind of just happens. Okay, I gotcha. Yeah, yeah, Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, we were we actually talked about this in our last collab. Uh, uh, Sukuna summoning Maharaga, and now it's happening. It's wild. Um, so before I go into like the what seems to be like the popular theory, I guess, or the the lately the most popular theory around like what Sukuna's origin is. Just, I'm just curious, like, what do you guys think currently of like what his origin is? Because I'll say like when I'm talking about Sukuna and you know what's going on with him, my reviews. Before I found out about this brother and twin stuff or whatever that we're going to be talking about, I assume that i don't know he was like altering his soul or something like mahito possibly because you know the soul stuff's coming up more and more um or he's figured out something that like tangan has because you know he's kind of similar to tangan but yet not the same so i'm just curious like operator um what do you think about sakuna like why he is the way that he is so um as far as Sukuna goes, uh, being born in the Heian era, I was kind of talking about this a little bit um, earlier um, on, on my own kind of stuff. But uh, so basically, for, in the Heian era, in order to be a sorcerer in, in an era where sorcery was at its peak thriving, you, in order to survive and just be able to live in that sort of environment, you yourself had to... Um, be as far as what Sukuna says to Jogo during the Shibuya incident, willing to burn everything to the ground in in you know in in order to get strength, in order to get stronger, and and it's kind of what Oro also says to Yuta when she says that Yuta's reached his peak because he doesn't have that selfish nature to break off and become a calamity. He has still that connection to the to the to the world around him. He's not willing to make that last severance to in order to gain that extra strength and ascend to that level that we see Sukuna at. I mean, as far as what Sukuna's is and what he's been doing, it seems like and something that I've always thought, especially since we saw him switch into Megami's body, is that Sukuna's just been body hopping and it's for uh, for a while now. This clearly isn't the first time that he's done this. And it also seems like it's pretty routine between him and Orame at this point that that they've done this before. Um, I also feel like that's part of the reason why Gege has mentioned that even though Sukuna looks just like Yuji, he has no relationship to Yuji. He's not an ancestor. Yuji's not a descendant of Sukuna, nothing. It makes me think that possibly back in the day, this also may be why Itadori was a perfect cage for Sukuna, that Sukuna may have body hopped into one of Itadori's ancestors back in the day or something along those lines. It makes me think that Sukuna has just been... This whole 20 finger thing, he was sealed. That's what the story says. I don't believe that. I think that's kind of a bunch of BS in my honest opinion. I feel like him getting split into 20 fingers was always a part of his plan. And just there's just so much we don't know about Sukuna that it's impossible to even say at this point until Gege gives us more t more things to uh, kind of decipher. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, in the beginning, I for sure thought that Sukuna was defeated. But then as the story goes on, it's like, who the hell defeated him? Like he's, he's so powerful. And now, you know, in these last couple chapters, it definitely seems like this was premeditated. Like, they wanted this to happen. Um, what do you think about that, Weeb? So actually, to kind of um, go back to what you're saying, how maybe Sukuna sort of like altered his soul or something, it reminded me that Sukuna definitely does have some unknown dominion over souls because he's the only character in the series who can straight up reject mahito's idol transfiguration we know like idol transfiguration can change 
the shape of the soul. But when Mahito tried to transfigure Sukuna in the Junpei arc, it's almost like Sukuna's soul just refused the transfiguration. Even like the second time when um, when Yuji just broke into Mahito, Mahito's domain, it like automatically made Sukuna to overwhelm the transfiguration because obviously his domain's guaranteed hit is idol transfiguration so it like forced Sukuna to defend his his own soul and this time attack Mahito's like he brought him into his innate domain um so I think that's really interesting how Sukuna has that dominance and it probably correlates to how he you know became the king of curses how he's evolved from every other curse I mean we know Gojo said that he was once a human before so on top of the fact that the body and the soul has played a recurring theme like you said um, then yeah, I think having some sort of dominance of his own soul is definitely a key factor to his full form or to maybe understanding what true Jujutsu Sorcery is. What, what do you think about that, Mir? Um, sort of like um, what Weeb said, that this has been planned the entire time. I entirely believe that this has been planned the entire time. If you remember what Kenjaku's goal was with Choso and the others in the beginning, the goal with Choso was to see and the rest of the brothers was to see how strong can he make somebody if they're a mix between human and cursed spirit and so we know that once kenjaku did you know the weird stuff with yuji's mom and yuji came out it was sort of like always planned that yuji would be the vessel for sakuna because he wanted to basically replicate something like what happened to choso he wanted to create a strong vessel for sakuna and we know that kenjaku has basically been having these plans for over 1000 years and sort of like you said, who in the world could have defeated Sukuna? We know that there's also like a volume extra that says that Sukuna literally has the power to destroy the world. And then I don't know if you guys know about them. There's a translation after Sukuna cuts Mahito, where it actually calls Sukuna the honored one throughout heaven and earth. So it's also like sort of like what um so it's also like sort of what Zona was saying. There's basically nobody back then who could have defeated Sukuna. Like he was basically this peak yeah he was basically this peak and then also with the fact that kenjaku has been having these plans over the past 1000 years and then you know the whole thing like i said with yuji being this strong vessel it seems that kenjaku probably had something to do with sakuna being split into 20 fingers you know he probably wasn't defeated it was always like sakuna's plan to come back like in a strong vessel and then you know do what needed to be done yeah i think it was actually um to kind of add on to that it may have been confirmed or at least heavily implied like before our crew entered the culling games um obviously yuji before he even uh, before he even stepped into a colony barrier he was already considered a culling game player and then they had like this realization because it was sakuna that kenjaku must have created a contract with sakuna um back in like the he and era or even before that so i do think yeah no jujutsu sorcerers ever defeated him back then it was kenjaku that made Sukuna be preserved into 20 Grave Wax Fingers. And it goes back to what uh, Operator was saying about that he and our flashback. I don't, and I'm not even 100% sure if we were going to fully get it at this point. I mean, I hope we do. We kind of have to. But um, to finish this off, we'll go into what the, I don't know, likely origin of Sukuna is. Uh, so in that urban legend that we were talking about with like the uh, the original sakuna corpse thing apparently he had like a twin with him uh, as operator mentioned in the beginning um so the whole thing about the twin is going to lead to why sakuna has like his forearms and his four eyes uh, because it's very possible that the bath uh, that we see in chapter 216 where urami has like this big wooden basket thing with all these bugs and they're all draining through a special selection of cursed energy solution and venom and all that stuff um i think this is possibly giving us insight into like sukuna's backstory because he possibly did something like this himself but it wasn't like bugs it was like people <laughs> uh so there's like this process called kodoku uh where all of these bugs and whatever these you know venomous creatures get them into like a, a cage or whatever have them all like battle royale <clears throat> and then the winner would be like revered or whatever so i don't know at the end of the the battle there'd be like one big like snake or 
like uh, something like that left. Uh, but in this case with Sukuna, it was like people. And it was like his brother was with him and he like literally ate people and his brother. And that's where we get like all of this cleave and dismantle and flaying and food stuff that's always like mentioned with Urarami and Sukuna. It, it's because like he's literally eating people and I know we've been talking about that for like years it's like oh Sukuna probably eats people gets her curse technique but it's like I think it's because of his backstory like he was forced to like cannibalize other sorcerers and his brother and that's why he has like the four eye, uh, the four eyes and the four arms and multiple curse techniques as well uh, because possibly like Cleve and Dismantle are like two sides of the same coin uh, and that also could parallel to the whole Maki and Mai thing that we just went through. Like, I also thought that was not odd, but interesting why they have, like, such a specific, like, dynamic and backstory to them. If it's not going to, like, purposely relate to something else, you know, not that it necessarily has to, but I think the whole Maki and Mai thing about, you know, the one curse technique is tethered to both of them and the... You know both of them existing at once is inhibiting the full potential of another uh i think it could be paralleling to uh sukuna's backstory but yeah what are your <laughs> what are you guys thoughts on that um okay i i'm definitely on the minority of this so uh me or noop you guys can like say um what you but because for me i actually don't think um, or I don't believe in like the Sukuna twin theory because if we kind of use Maki and Mai's heavenly restriction as an example, they were like restricting both their powers. Obviously, in the latest chapter, we see what Mai could have been um, with like the potential of the construction technique, as we see with Yorozu. And then for Maki, obviously, she didn't have her like cursed energy fully depleted. So from like that heavenly restriction, um, they were kind of. Uh, limiting their own powers so if we kind of tie that to sukuna if he had a twin then yeah like he would have like the four arms and like the entire features he had but i think the general consensus is that okay so with mai and maki since like mai died maki's now like she has like her fully awakened heavenly restriction so if sukuna ate his twin then to me it would be weird how instead of getting like more powerful he degraded from getting four arms and now he only has two arms he looks i guess less demonic so that's kind of like a um i guess a contradiction to that theory but i don't know if, i guess personally to me i just i don't know how i'd feel if sukuna had like a twin back in the day i'm definitely on the minority of this so uh i don't know what you know up and, and mir think okay well i actually sort of like the theory that he had a twin and it would sort of actually make sense if he had a twin and killed him or ate him. Because uh, No Operator sort of said it a bit earlier. We were talking about the mindset that Sukuna has and what Sukuna did to disregard all others. Oh, the scan itself says, When Ryu is talking to Yuta after the fight, and Ryu tells Yuta, I've seen what surpasses the horizon of sorcerers, cursed spirits, and strong fighters. It's overwhelming aggression that disregards all else like a calamity. And it shows that picture of like back in the day prime Sukuna. And it's like sort of what Sukuna was telling the Jogo that you have to disregard all others and basically say screw everybody else. So say if he did have a twin and ate him, it would be like the epitome of disregarding everybody else. Disregarding somebody who's supposed to be close to you would be like the highest form of disregarding everyone else. Because it goes to show that no matter how close of a bond you have with somebody, twins literally being the closest bond, that person is a mirror of yourself. After eating them or killing them, you have fully like realized yourself in that mindset of being a calamity. So I think it would like fit Sukuna perfectly. Wait, sorry, Noah, but I this actually just kind of brought up to my mind. I think if you said earlier that like Sukuna didn't have any relatives, or am I? I probably just misheard that. Right, but I, I I swear I saw that like in a fan book or something. Well, I, so not so. I don't know so much about relatives. I know in the in the data book it says he didn't have any descendants. Like he didn't like. Oh. Okay. Uh, and basically, he was saying that like Yuji and Sakuna looking alike has nothing to do with Yuji being like his great 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 grandson or anything like that. Like Sakuna didn't have any lovers. He didn't bother any children or anything like that. Okay. So yeah. Never mind. The twin three can is still uh, viable. <laughs> what What do you think of it overall, uh, operator? 
Uh, I think it's completely possible because um, while I was kind of looking into the twin theory, um, just as everyone was kind of talking, I did see that uh, Ryoman actually does mean two faced. Um, oh. And also in the um, in the one panel that um, Mir um, put down, it says for the double faced specter, he doesn't care. And that one translation um, when he's uh, summoning his domain and using it against Mahito um, to save Nanami and Yuji. Uh, it, it it definitely seems like the whole two face thing is something that pertains to Sukuna in some way, shape, or form. Be that because he has a twin, or be that because he's got someone grafted onto him. I feel like it's something very similar to the whole Star Plasma Vessel um, Tengen kind of thing. Um, because even Kenjaku, after he survives the black hole, he kind of looks at Tengen, sees what he looks like now, and goes, "Oh wow, you kind of look like Sukuna a little bit." Um, so I'm not, I feel like that is relevant in some way, shape, or form. Um, I feel like both of their forms have something to do with each other. It has something to be with uh, an ascended form that we just don't really know much about yet. Again, we need more information to kind of figure that out. But I feel like that was really interesting. And the fact that Ryoman means two-faced, um, it's a specific point to for Gege to name him that. Um, the double face specter, the fact that he literally has the two faces and a lot of the work he has. And as Mir mentioned, um, that is definitely a key point to his character, um, the whole two face thing. Whether that means he has a twin or it means something else, the forearms, everything, um, it, it definitely means a lot. Um, one thing that I thought is really interesting is that um, both uh, Sukuna Megami and Yorozu Sumiki are both choosing to stay in their regular sorcerer forms because they claim it is um it's easier to fight sorcerers this way um i don't know how what any of you guys think i think it's also a way uh so gege can be lazy and not have to draw sakuna in his four-armed monstrous form but that's just me <laughs> um yeah that that is, i i questioned that myself in the review i i i thought that that meant um he knows that he's going to fight Kenjaku's big ultimate thing, the uh, humanity or Japan merged with Tengen. Yeah, I found it uh, kind of odd, like um, when Sukuna said, "Oh, this form is easier to fight sources with," because I would assume, okay, if you have your full form with the four arms and everything, like, wouldn't that be like more powerful? So it, it definitely confused me for a bit, and I'm interested to see why it's easier to stay in, I guess, his current form. Um, but yeah, that's it for this one. This was a good conversation. It could have been better on my part. I could have had more material presented, but I appreciate you guys coming, uh, dropping your thoughts on this. Everybody watching, please check out Mir's channel, No Operator, Fake Weeb, all making fantastic Jujutsu Kaisen content and other series as well. But that's pretty much it, guys. Like the video if you liked it. Have a great one. I'll see you in the next. All right, so we're talking about Sukuna's curse technique in this video, and mainly because new information was brought to my attention by Lightning446 on Twitter. Go follow them. They're great. One of the top Jujutsu Kaisen Twitter people or content creators, whatever you want to call them. But apparently, we could be seeing a parallel between Gege's previous work to Jujutsu Kaisen and Sukuna's current ability. So, Gege's first series, or one of his first series, was called Number Nine. And the main character of that was Hiromasa Sukumo. I know, interesting, Sukumo carryover. Well, there's gonna be a bunch of carryover, but this character, his like ability is that he can summon weapons using his ability called Box Nine. And he does this by calling Open, or Fuga, as the same way that Sukuna does, like the exact same phrasing, wording, everything. And the first thing that Sukumo brings out is like a bow and arrow. Same thing as Sukuna when he says open, uh, when he's going against Jogo. And he is also able to use like a machete, a sword, a hammer, uh, an iron fist. Also, he's fighting uh, one of the opponents that he faced in that series, uh, summons a creature called Orochi. Now, Orochi is, you know, ubiquitous to battle manga and, you know, Asian mythology and whatnot, but still, similarities. So, I think that this is pretty much what Sukuna's ability is. But more, going more into that, I want to touch on another theory by another Twitter creator by the name of Malua, 
where they break down Viz's translation better on what Yorozu refers to uh, Sukuna's curse technique as, because she says that it is malevolent shrine. But even before that, like when we were looking up the spoilers for that chapter, uh, the spoiler people or Miyamura said that it was just called shrine. And I thought that was better because like, oh, that'd be cool if that was just his curse technique and malevolent shrine is the domain expansion. But it seems like it is called shrine. But going deeper into that, it's not necessarily like a, a holy shrine, like a place you go to to pray or worship, but it's more so like a, a feratory, which is a type of shrine where like holy relics are stored essentially, and it's portable. So that seems like what is applicable to uh, what Sukuna is doing here. His uh, shrine is what his innate ability is. And... There's some other stuff about uh, <laughs> Indra and Ashra and the uh, the Pashu Patastra <laughs> and the <laughs> Barahata, which is an in, uh, Hindu <laughs> epic. I'm not good at this, guys. I'm American. You know, we're not good at that stuff. But I think this all makes sense, and uh, it could lead to Sukuna having all of the weapons that we just mentioned, along with a uh, another bow and arrow. Uh, which is lightning, not just fire. It, you know, it goes back to when Sukuna originally showed us the flame arrow uh, against Jogo, and he says, Oh, that's right, I thought you'd know about this, but I suppose a cursed spirit wouldn't. You could take that many ways, but I guess it just means that Jogo, either being a cursed spirit, is relatively a new being on Earth, like he hasn't lived as long, but also maybe he wouldn't be able to look into history the way that everyone else can and see you know, if there's any documented evidence of what Sukuna was able to do in the past. Uh, but your thoughts on uh, Sukuna's curse technique, possibly being Shrine, and him having just multiple abilities because of that. And then I'll go more into what could be responsible for him having these multiple abilities. All that was interesting. It should say that, yeah, Sukuna has some sort of Doring type maneuver. And honestly, this just reminded me, similar to Rika, uh, and they kind of shared similarities, right, with like Rika being the queen of curses and she stores techniques, uh, uh, Sukuna being the king of curses. So Sukuna could have like an arsenal of tertiary techniques, like the fire ability stored within, I guess, like the metaphysical shrine place. Um, and like you said, a malevolent shrine in like the Japanese kanji does translate to demonic territory. And you said territory is like a container, right? Yeah, portable for okay. like uh, holy objects. Okay, a container that holds relics for saints. I guess like if we were to tie that into Jutaizen, well, saints can easily be replaced for sorcerers and relic, you know, prized possession stuff could tie to like Sukuna's other cursed techniques or tertiary abilities. So this malevolent shrine could overall translate to a container or a portable storing place for Sakuna to well store them. And I think that the design of malevolent shrine also helps with that. The dead skull, the huge mouth in the center, or it can, can further convey that this theory where Sakuna, who's already confirmed a cannibal back then, eats and stores the user's technique within his shrine. And to use those techniques, he needs to open this shrine place, just like he did in the fight with Jogo and in the fight with Maharaga. Yeah, also as well, in the fan book, they give the names. When you look at other characters and what their techniques are, it, it normally has a name for them, but we don't have a name for Sukuna's technique. It just says Sukuna's technique and that it is a slashing hellfire of a slaughter. And then it also says that even though cursed techniques commonly only have one characteristic, Sukuna's is confirmed to have at least two, which you can say implies that there's more. And that goes back to like the shrine thing that you guys said. When he said open against Jogo and Jogo was surprised, he said, oh, I thought you would have known about this. That could be implying that he thought that Jogo should have known about that he can bring out other techniques or you can say that he just thought Jogo was supposed to know about the fire but if it's going back to like the shrine thing like you guys said a place where you stored things then that means he was basically saying to Jogo oh I thought that you would have known that I can use other curse techniques yeah no I, I think at this point we've probably seen enough to for sure like I'm just reading this fan book right now like we've seen enough to establish that Sukuna's cleave and dismantle his slashing abilities are his main base attacks because way before I thought there could be more, but I think that's it. But then of course his fire, the fact that he has to say open to unlock said ability, uh, it does make me believe that the storing type maneuver is sort of Sukuna's a second, I guess, technique. 
I'm curious about the tattoos, because we see tattoos like Tsukuna's in the Edo period in Japan, and usually they were prison tattoos, or at least like convict tattoos. And when he says open, a lot of people think they are equivalent with the tattoos. And the weapons that Tsukuna uses generally, like the Pashi Patastra that you mentioned, you have things like the Trishula, which is the giant trident that you see him use. And in Hinduism, that's supposed to be this unstoppable weapon that was used by Shiva. So I've always had a theory like maybe that would be used to break infinity, because a lot of foreign weapons in Jujutsu Kaisen, that's what disrupts the technique, like Inverted Spear of Heaven or the Black Whip. It's never something from Japan. Yes, that is true. And I'm, I'm glad we're going more into the cursed uh, tools here because that could be the secret here. Now, honestly, I'm not really sure. I think it could be either Sukuna consuming people because that's what I thought at the beginning. Or it could be him doing something with cursed tools. Because that's what we could possibly be seeing. Like, cleave, dismantle, they're like blades. And then he has the fire arrow thing. Or when you said about the marks on his body, when he says open, there's like that box next to him. And we see the box on his body. So it could have something to do with some kind of binding vow or just the way that his abilities work. He has to have it on his body for some reason. Also, it's a great way to, you know, denote that Sukuna has taken over somebody, but maybe if it's not eating somebody because i've also said before that you know he could be paralleling uh, like we've said to rika king and queen of curses uh, apparently i mean it's not straight up confirmed but it's implied that rika needs to consume blood or the flesh of somebody and then that's how kotsu gains their ability and also when we saw rika like open up her whatever she opens up there's like all those like swords and weapons and stuff in here which is you know just like what we we're talking about with the uh, shrine but maybe it is him receiving curse tools maybe because going back to chapter 219 after he kills Hirozu, she gives him one final thing we don't get to see what it is but it's implied that she's constructing something and I think this is supposed to mirror to what happened with Mai and Maki. Like, you know, as Mai was dying, she made the soul-cutting sword for Maki. And considering that they both have almost exactly the same curse techniques, or is it the same? I don't know, we'll talk about that later. But uh, Yorozu is constructing something for Sukuna. She says, here, this is for you. Think of it as me and use it with care. And we don't see Sukuna have anything with him when he's going against Gojo. And she does say shrine. She knows of what Sukuna's ability is. She has history with him. So maybe that's what it is. And like, she gave him this thing, which could also go back to the whole Hindu epic thing, because they were gifted the Vajra and uh, that other P word. <laughs> So what, so what she could be doing is uh, in mirroring that as well and giving him maybe the thing that he needs to defeat Gojo, like you were saying, what can take down Limitless. So what, what do you think about that? While y'all talk about that, I'm going to try to find, there's something in the fan book about Mai's construction techniques. I'm going to be looking for that. I'm glad you mentioned the Vajra because there's a lot of hints towards Tsukuna being the Susano god or the god Susano in Japanese mythology within Jujutsu Kaisen. Like him fighting Yamato no Orochi being a harvest ritual deity. Um, I think it's pretty obvious for Japanese readers. I've had some tell me that at least. But him having the Vajra, which was the weapon of Indra to summon lightning, I mean, I think that's pretty fitting. And most of his weapons seem to be like a divine art Arsenal contained within this shrine yeah so unfortunately i haven't done my due diligence on like the whole japanese mythology stuff but i am like looking at chapter 219 when uh yorozu does supposedly create something with her technique and give it to sakuna it does parallel to what my maki did the kind of like doubt i'm having is that with the mind maki we did see like the sword spawn in or whatever like what mike created in that scene whereas with sakuna i'm like when i'm looking at these panels i'm thinking did yorozu actually actually end up creating something or did she like disappear before she could actually make something because like you said we didn't see anything with Sukuna unless it's somewhere hidden portably I don't really know but yeah that's kind of my thoughts on it I definitely think that she made something for Sukuna because if you look at back when Gojo comes back at the end of that chapter remember when Gojo and Sukuna are about to scrap but Kenjaku pulls up Sukuna has a flashback to those words that Yorozu says about teaching him about love like he has a flashback to whatever she created
created in that moment before they accept the the fight again for a later date i'll go grab that yeah i wondered what that was about yeah i mean that could be it for sure i've always interpreted that line with sakuna like obviously not in a love romantic way it's just like whatever she made he he's about to use like he thought about it and then accepts the fight mm, okay i i see what you mean yeah uh what, what do you guys think until we get the full sukuna backstory it's kind of hard to make like a definitive statement on what he means by love because sukuna wasn't always like four-eyed forearm demon man so him being close with people like kenjaku and tengen who were friends previously and tengen and kenjaku at the very least tengen weren't always like problematic in society tengen was going around preaching buddhism in the nara period and then 200 years later sukuna pops up as the king of curses so something went down during that time yeah i, I speculated that i mean this is a topic for another time but he maybe had a brother we actually talked about this in another collab i think but like he maybe had a brother or something and then ate him or fused with him or something just something he did that led him to having the body that he has like with the forearms and like the weird face and the four eyes whatever he did like it, it probably had something to do with that uh ritual the bath ritual uh but instead of making like a cursed tool it just made sakuna the way that he is and then then once he successfully did it he was just the one above all essentially i think uh yeah it says my's cursing what does it say Yoru's curse technique it says construction because they suddenly have the same curse technique but they use it in different ways though i'm like uh, i'm reading the panel again so in that chapter when gojo and sakuna has an encounter and when sakuna sees gojo talking about to delay the date for their battle and he thinks about Yorozu's quote of like I have much more to teach you about love and the ultimate strength and the salt that it brings so uh Mir just to like understand so you were thinking that oh Sukuna was going to use whatever Yorozu's technique uh, or whatever yeah. Yorozu created back then yeah yeah basically uh, okay. it's like he's he's looking over well hearing the offer that Gojo's making then he has a flashback to what Yorozu crafted or whatever she was saying when she was crafting him the tool and then he accepts the fight okay but I think that like panel when uh, Yorozu said, I have much more to teach you about love. It wasn't like when Yorozu was crafting, you know, whatever she did to Sakuna or whatever she crafted for Sakuna. I think that quote like oh, correlates right. back to, it was like the same chapter, but it was like in the flashback. So when Yorozu first met Sakuna, do you guys know what I mean? Or, I, I don't know what that. Yeah, that yeah. pretty sure it was from the flashback or the- uh... For some reason, I can't find the exact quote though. It's uh, at the end of uh, 218. Oh, 218. Okay, I was looking at 219. Yeah, it's the uh, the the last it, it's the second to last page yeah so like um i think like my interpretation of that quote was like sakuna just acknowledging that not, of course not in a like a lovey-dovey way with gojo but gojo is someone that can validate his own strength and that's why he is sort of okay to delay the day and also of course uh you know i think kenjaku has like a binding vow with him where he can't actually say no and uh, or else something would happen with the binding vows they made oh interesting yeah there there is definitely a lot of binding vows going on that we're not uh privy to for sure but I think I, I agree with both of you. I agree with Weeb's take on this because, yeah, that statement does mean that for sure. But also him thinking back to what she was saying could be both. It could be remembering what she said and how it relates to Gojo for sure, but also remembering what she did for him at the end of her life and giving him that whatever cursed object cursed tool so yeah i think it could be both here but that's gonna be it for this one guys thank you to the fake weeb mirror and quirkless shinobi for coming by for this week's discussion really appreciate it guys yeah thank you guys thank you for having me thank you thank you yeah, glad to be here yeah always and uh subscribe to their channels if you have not already don't subscribe to mine <laughs> and uh no guys subscribe to zoning <laughs> leave some comments give the video a like and uh see you the next one